Hello, everybody. My name is Chance McGinnis, and I am a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board, the official student group here at the Dole. First of all, welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics, and thank you for attending today's program presented by the Department of Military History at the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth. The Dole Institute would like to hear from you about today's program. Please let us know if you have any feedback by contacting us on social media or via email at the Dole Institute at ku.edu. To view past programs, visit our online archive at www.doleinstitute.org. A video of today's presentation will also be on our website soon. We would like to encourage each of you to consider becoming friends of the Dole Institute. Our friends program helps keep our program free and open, and it supports archive research and our student activities. Please contact us if you are interested. After the presentation, we will have some time for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker will come to, with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you're able and ask just one brief question. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. And now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Tom Hansen, the Director of the Department of Military History at the Command College at Fort Leavenworth. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for taking the time out of your afternoon to join us today. I'd also like to thank the Dole Institute for continuing to be very gracious hosts for the History for the Military Mind lecture series. This is our fifth year of pr producing this lecture series, and your attendance is testament to its popularity. So thank you very much. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Sean Faulkner, who is one of the country's preeminent historians of the First World War, particularly the American experience. He is a uh, retired armor officer. Uh, he's a graduate of that other university in Kansas that I won't mention. Uh, but more importantly, he is the author of two books on the American experience in World War I. The first called The School of Hard Knocks, which is about combat experience. And the second, which was just published by the University Press of Kansas, is called Pershing's Crusaders, which is a detailed examination of uh, all things Doughboy in 1917 and 1918. And you're about to get a presentation on some of the challenges that those doughboys faced when they arrived in France in 1917 about how to get across that protected area so they could actually get to the enemy and force a decision. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Sean Faulkner. Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to thank the Dole Institute for, uh, for inviting me out today to lecture and also their continued support of our department uh, lecture series with them. Now, I do have to ask a question. If there's anybody here who gets easily depressed, this is probably not the briefing for you. We're gonna talk about some ugly things, some ugly aspects of, uh, of human history and military history. Uh, and if you look at it, there's three things I wanna to accomplish today. Uh, one is to explain why there is a trench stalemate on the Western Front in World War I. Then we're going to examine the trials and tribulations as the different combatants tried to break this stalemate and lastly, in the process of figuring out this devil's dilemma, how the combatants inadvertently create modern warfare. Uh, in other words, the warfare, the doctrine that we teach at Fort Leavenworth today, in many ways is just the grandchildren of what these people are learning with blood, sweat, toil, and tears in World War I. Now, when you look at the Great War, it doesn't have a great reputation. When most people think about World War I, they think about trench warfare. When they think about trench warfare, they think about utter futility. Sending hundreds of thousands of young men, the best and the brightest of Europe, to their death to accomplish nothing. And there's some truth to this. In fact, there's a bunch of myths that start to arise in World War I. And like all myths, they have elements of truth. And one of the ones that comes out in the 1960s is this one. That these armies of World War I consisted of lions young, virile, patriotic young men who were led to their death by donkeys. Lions led by donkeys. And there's some truth to this. I mean, if you look at Douglas Haig, the commander of the British Army, he's about a two-watt bulb, okay? He's a pretty dim guy. And World War I puts a, puts a black eye on the military profession that we, we've still never overcome. In fact, one of the words that comes out, or one of the terms is chateau generalship that the generals like Douglas Haig stayed well behind the lines in chateaus, drinking champagne and bouncing mademoiselles on their knees while their soldiers died in, in the front, with the generals having no conception of what they're asking the soldiers to do. And again, there's some truth to this. 
But as we look at some of the myths, we'll see why Chateau Generalship actually came about. But what I'm going to ask you to do tonight is to think about some of these myths. And I'm going to ask you to give a little sympathy for the devil. These officers, these generals, are confronted with something between 1914 and 1918 that nothing in their previous education, nothing in their experience, and nothing in their training has prepared them for. And they have to puzzle it out. One of the biggest things they have to deal with is this. In the 50 years between the ending of the American Civil War and the beginning of World War I, sees one of the most fundamental and revolutionary changes in military technology in human history. In fact, some would argue that there is more that happens in military technological change in those 50 years than had occurred in the previous three millennia of human existence. And this just gives you an example of what's changing. In the American Civil War, a rifleman was getting off three shots a minute. If he was lucky, he could hit a man-sized target at 400 meters. Thanks to the Frenchman named Paul Biel, he invented smokeless powder. With the changes of this second industrial revolution, you get all these new ideas. You take smokeless powder, you made it to a new weapon system, the magazine bolt-action rifle. So by the time you get to World War I, the infantryman is getting off 15 to 20 shots a minute. But there's more. Time of the Civil War, the cannon was getting off maybe one, one and a half shots a minute, and the range was pretty limited. These shells that they were firing were not effective. But by the time you get to World War I, you see a massive change. In 1897, the French come out with the French 75 gun, the world's first modern artillery piece. And what makes it modern is not only that it's a breech loader, not only that it's firing fixed ammunition now, but the most importantly, underneath that barrel is a hydraulic recoil mechanism. You fire that Civil War cannon, it goes rolling way back, and you have to laboriously move it back into position. Thanks to that French invention, when you fired it, it stays right there. What that means is, by the time of World War I, the artillerymen were, were getting off 15 to 20 shots a minute. In other words, for a surge period of time, a French artilleryman could fire that cannon as rapidly as the infantrymen could fire the rifle. Last but not least, 1886, an American named Hiram Maxim invents the world's first true automatic weapon, the Maxim gun. He uses physics. Each action has an equal but opposite reaction. You put a big spring on the side of the bolt. When it fires, the spring catches the bolt, runs it back into battery. When you automate fire that way, you now create a weapon that is able to fire five to 600 rounds a minute. Now, when you take bolt-action rifles, when you take rapid-fire modern artillery, and you take Maxim guns, what that means is the battlefield is a much more deadly place than it was for the soldiers of the Civil War. Now, the myth is these silly generals had no idea that all this technological change was going to change warfare. That's absolute bunk. They absolutely know that this is going to cause problems. In fact, if they didn't figure it out, a Russian named Ivan de Bloc has also told them this. In 1898, Ivan de Bloc writes a, a very influential book called The Future of War, where he says, if you look at the amount of development in weapons, and you look at the lethality that it's going to create, and you look at how much now the societies are going to have to feed into war, Warfare has fundamentally changed and it is going to be devastating to your society. He actually creates uh, apocalyptic visions where the soldiers on the new battlefield will actually take and break, build barricades of their dead comrades to hide from the fire. Now, if you're a military guy and you read Yvon de Bloc, he has just given you a very ugly thing to think on. A long attritional war will destroy you. In fact, the block says that the amount of resources you're going to pour into this and blood, sweat, toil, and tears means that ultimately your societies are going to collapse in the revolution. They're not going to be able to keep doing this. The generals take this to heart. They have seen the effects of this firepower. They've seen it in the Boer War. They've seen it in the Russo-Japanese War, and they've seen it in the Balkan Wars. They are absolutely aware how deadly the battlefield's going to be. The problem is... They don't know what to do about it. And Yvonne de Bloc might be right. So going into World War I, you have a number of assumptions that all of the combatants are making. First and most importantly is war is inevitable. It's going to happen. 
Now, there is that argument that once you say it's going to happen, you probably make it inevitable, but that, that's neither here nor there. They absolutely believe that it's going to be bloody. But they also have convinced themselves that it's going to be short. The side that mobilizes first, the side that moves first, the side that attacks first will be the one that achieves victory. And while we will have monumental casualties, it'll be in a short amount of time, and then the war will be over. <coughs> they make their plans around a short war, and we'll see how that's going to affect them when they get the war that they don't anticipate. Of course, the German solution of this is the Schlieffen plan. What uh, Winston Churchill calls the most important public document, perhaps, in human history. This is the Germans' attempt to make sure that Yvonne de Bloc is wrong. If we can mobilize and move before the French armies can get going, we can knock the French army out of the war, we can avoid all of that firepower because we're going to hit them on the flanks and the rear, and then we can turn and deal with the Russians. And I love that quote from Woody Allen. If you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. As we all know, this plan goes off the rails in a disastrous fashion in September of 1914 with the Battle of the Marne. So by the time you have early October 1914, you have two armies glaring at each other, north of Paris along the Aisne River. And the first thing they're trying to do is now find the flank of the other folks. Because then they can get the momentum back. They can gain the initiative. The problem is the other guy's thinking the same thing. And so by the time you get to November of 1914, you now have nearly an unbroken line of trenches, uh, unli un unbroken line of troops going 400 miles from the North Sea in Belgium all the way to the Swiss border. And these opening weeks of the war have been devastating. In fact, on one day, the 22nd of August, 1914, the French lose 27,000 dead. Just to put that into perspective, uh, in nearly 17 years of fighting in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, the U.S. military has lost 6,997 dead. And they don't have an answer to this. The soldiers, though, have figured out something. If you're going to live on this battlefield, you had better dig deep. Because only by digging into Mother Earth are you going to escape the nasty bullets, the nasty shells that are flying. And in 1914, this is what those trenches look like. They're pretty basic. Uh, in fact, they're, they're really just scrapes in the ground. And at this point in time of the war, all it would take is fresh troops heavy artillery and shells to dig them out. That's the problem when you go into the war with a short war mentality. If you don't plan for a long war, then you don't plan for industrial mobilization. You don't plan for bringing in more reinforcements. This is going to be a come-as-you-are war. And by the time that the nations of Europe slowly but painfully get those mobilization juices flowing, those trenches go from this, something that could easily be pierced, to this. And now you have a problem. These donkeys leading the lions are the first to figure this out. Ferdinand Foch will end the war as the generalissimo of all the Allied army. Uh, prior to the war, had been an instructor at the French War College. And so in the late fall of 1914, this is what he turns to his staff and tells them, guys, I was wrong. Forget what I trained you on, and we're all going to have to learn together. Now, here's the problem. This is an actual British trench map from the Somme Front of 1916. If you were to look at this trench map as a military professional prior to World War I, you'd be lost. There's new things on this map that weren't there before. First of all, the whole map is gridded off because the new killer on the battlefield is artillery. And the gridding of this off will now allow you to better use the artillery. If you will notice there, you've got these little red squiggly lines. Those red lines are the German trenches. And the way that you find out about the German trenches is setting you up for one of the other realities of World War I. In no other human endeavor is necessity more 
the mother of invention than warfare. If artillery is going to be the big killer, then you have to figure out where the enemy's trenches are, where their concentration is. The way to do that is you now take this new toy called the airplane, you fly it over their lines, and you take pictures. Or you're going to adjust your artillery. You fly the aircraft over the lines and have them spot where the artillery needs to fall. But now what we see is this race. The minute that both sides mutually find out that aviation, the high ground, is going to be one of the things that's going to give them the advantage on, bat on the battlefield, you start to see this arms race. And we'll see this come back time and time again in World War I. The minute you think you've got something figured out, the minute that you've got a cool new weapon system that gives you an advantage, it tells the other guy that they had to better find another way to uh, overcome it or find a way to go one more. You see this in the development of aircraft. You see that aircraft at the top. That's the aircraft that the Germans start World War I with, a Taub, because the wings look like a dove. Taub is German for dove. It's barely an improvement over the Wright Flyer that had just flown 13 years before. It's not armed. It flies over, makes its little notes, comes back. But now, it's my advantage to find that Taub and shoot it down and to keep the Germans from doing that to me. So we call this the challenge and response dynamic. In fact, in 1915, you'll get the world's first fighter plane. And as soon as the Germans come out with this fighter plane, now the Allies have to match it. And you see how rapidly the development of these weapon systems is, are, is occurring over the, the space of the war. Today we have something called the F-35 fighter plane. It's been developed for 30 years, and we still can't get it to fly like it's supposed to. The air, fly, air life of an aviation, of an airplane in World War I is measured in months, not years. Because within a few months, the other guy is coming up with something that'll go higher, go faster, uh, go further, have more weapons than what you have, and now you've got to up your game. But now we're going to take this map and look at the devil's dilemma that is trench warfare. When you look at the trenches, it's not a single trench. These trenches are actually laid out in depth. And you see on our map here, we have three lines of trenches, three belts of trenches on the soil. Now, just to have some fun, forward of those belts of trenches are staked in barbed wire, six to 10 yards deep, okay? This is German barbed wire. I actually dug it up from right here, okay? Now, I, you know, this is Kansas, it's a nice agricultural state. Has anybody ever seen any barbed wire like that? Now, that's, that's German anal retentive barbed wire, right? <laughs> and you have that barbed wire forward of your trenches for one major thing. You're not going to stop the attack, but you want to hold the attackers in no man's land, that space between your trenches and the enemy's trenches, as long as you possibly can, because that's where you're going to do the majority of the killing. So let's look at our problem. We have our three belts of trenches. We'll take it step by step by step. The first step is easy. You've got to get up out of your trenches of the attacker, and you've got to cross no man's land. Simple. Oh, the minute you step out of your trench, how much of you does the enemy see? The full Monty. How much of him do you see? About that much. We've got an issue now. Something has to happen to keep the enemy's head down, to kill him, to wound him, to make him scared, to make him run away, to give my guys a hope and hell a chance of getting up out of my, their trenches and crossing no man's land. Now, you would think, well, you just bring your machine guns with you. Well, but I didn't tell you the problem with that Maxim gun. That German Maxim gun weighs 124 pounds. That's just the gun. Then there's all the ammunition and the water, because it's a water-cooled machine gun. You know what you look like crossing no man's land with a 124-pound machine gun? Slow-moving target. Please insert bullet here. OK, there's a problem. So there's my first dilemma. I've got to find a way to keep their heads down. Because then I'm going to get to the second dilemma. Once I cross no man's land, the, the fun has just started. Now I have to clear the enemy out of the first line of trenches. Now, crossing around no man's land, you can probably assume that you have taken some pretty heavy casualties. So I have to, 
at that point of penetration, when I jump in the enemy's trench, I had better have a lot more guys, a lot more Muldoons with me than they have defending. Okay? So, I've crossed no man's land. I have jumped into the first set of trenches. But now, I've got to rinse and repeat. I've got to break through now the next belt of trenches, and I've got to go on and get to the next belt of trenches after that. Now here's the problem. If I am lucky enough to have captured the first set of trenches, I'm spent. I've lost too many officers, I've lost too many soldiers, I'm short on ammunition. You can't rely on those guys to continue the attack. They're done. So now to break through the subsequent belts of trenches, I've got to bring up fresh troops and I've got to bring up more supplies. Oh, here's the catch. Each one of those successive waves of troops coming to take out the next belts of trenches have to cross no man's land. And all of that nastiness in between. Once I capture a trench, I know dang well that the Germans are going to counterattack. It's part of their doctrine. That means that I have to bring all the equipment with me so when I capture that trench, I can now set it up for the defense. That means that the Battle of Somme, the British soldiers are carrying 65 to 85 pounds of gear, crossing no man's land. And if you're carrying no man's land, 85 pounds of gear, what do you look like? Slow moving target, please insert bullet here. Okay, with me, good. And they're doing that time and time again. Now then, if you're successful, you get to the good stuff. You can go to challenge four. I have crossed no man's land. I have broken into the first set of trenches. I have broken through the subsequent sets of trenches. And now I can break out into the open where the Germans now can't hide behind their trenches. Through the mud, through the blood, to the green, green fields beyond, as the British will say. Simple. Well, let's, let's add a little complication here, okay? I like to put things into perspective that, that uh, folks can sort of relate to. Uh, I love this map. This is one of those maps created by guys flying over the enemy trenches. Uh, this is a trench map that the, uh, the Anzac Corps, the Australian New Zealand Corps, uh, developed in 1917 uh, for the Battle of Ypres. Now, it's sort of hard to see, but each one of those little greenish, block, greenish rectangles is a German infantry company. And what we have here in a space that's only three miles deep by four miles across are three German divisions. Let's just say, for sake of argument, uh, the strength of about 14,000 men. Standard military doctrine that the, is that the attacker needs a three to one advantage to overcome the defense. So, now I'm from Lansing. Actually, live out in Leavenworth. Uh, if you were to take and put this into perspective, in that three mile by four mile area would be every man, woman, and child in Lansing and Leavenworth defending that area. And to win, the attacker is going to have to kill, have to capture, have to wound, or have to make those guys run away if I'm going to break through here. Now, at a three to one advantage, Hmm. It would require every man, woman, and child in Kansas City, Kansas to break through on a three mile by four mile front. But here's the deal. That technology that had been developed is giving most of the advantage to the defenders. So really in World War I, it's not a three to one advantage. It's really a five to one advantage that you need to break through. So that means to take out every man, woman, and child in Lansing and Leavenworth, I need the entire population of Kansas City, Kansas, and every man, woman, and child in Douglas County, Kansas, to make it through. Hmm. But I still got to get back to just crossing no man's land. That if the good people of Douglas County and Kansas City, Kansas, want to live to get on the other side, then they really want to kill as many people, defenders in those trenches as they possibly can. And the first thing they turn to is artillery. And artillery is going to be the big killer on the battlefield. 70% of the war's casualties will be caused by shell fire. So now we've got to figure out how to best use the artillery to get what we need, 
to suppress the enemy, to keep him down in the hole, or kill him, to give my attackers a hope. And what you see here is the Allies trying to figure this out. Now, before the, the lecture, I actually paced off the area here. It's six yards across. And if you look at this, these are the pounds of shell that are falling within every yard of trench. This is a World War I shell from a French 75 gun. Okay? It weighs right around 15 pounds. Okay? That's just a, an average shell. So when the British finally get success on the 14th of July, the magic number they come up with is 660 pounds of shell falling for every yard of trench. Now, I'm a history guy, so I'd have to take off my shoes to do the addition. But you sort of see that there's a lot of shells just falling within this area. But you'll notice that even though they sort of figure that out, they're still going back and forth. You guys are shocked by this, uh, this quote. Yeah, Ferdinand Foch, again, we go back to him, he's a, he's a good guy, uh, is probably telling the truth, though. What you're seeing here is figuring it out. That we had to invent a whole new science of artillery during the Great War. You are inventing it as they go. The same tactics, the same procedures that the U.S. Army uses today were figured out in 1914 to 1918. The problem with 660 shells is that's a lot of people back home doing a lot of production. The politicians are telling the generals, you guys figure it out. Our society is, are, is under immense pressure. And at the end of the day, Yvonne de Bloc may be right. I'm not so sure how we can push people before they crack. Generals, I can't keep giving you 660 pounds of shell per yard of trench. Figure out what that sweet pot spot is to do it. And so what Foch is telling you is sadly the truth, that in this revolutionary period of warfare, these generals have to learn the craft, have to figure out the new realities, something they've never been prepared for. And sadly, when you figure it out, it's costing human lives to do it. But there's a second problem. When you start firing 660 pounds of shell per yard of trench, you are literally changing the face of the earth. I love these pictures. Little, little uh, farmhouse bouquet farm on the Somme. That's what that looks like in June of 1916, and that's what that same farmhouse looks like less than three months later. You see the same thing with the little uh, Belgian town of Passchendaele. You believe that you have to do this to allow your infantry to attack, but you're creating huge amounts of problems. First of all, just for the attackers, getting out of their trench and crossing no man's land, it's slowing down their movement forward. But the biggest problem is, even if you're successful now in capturing the first set of trenches, maybe even the second and third set of trench, you have so changed the surface of the earth You've created an impassable zone. So you have made it damn near impossible to go to the fourth phase, even if you wanted to. Because I'm going to have to bring my artillery across this, my big stick, my big killer. I'm going to have to bring fresh troops. I'm going to have to bring fresh supplies. And to get them across this shell-torn ground means I'm going to have to have engineers working and digging and working and digging. And the amount of time it actually takes to clear the path to fix this, the Germans have dropped back 10 and dug in somewhere else. Hmm. We also have another problem. While weapons technology has continued to grow at a fast pace, other technologies, specifically command and control technology, signal technology, has stagnated. This is what you can use. And the most modern piece of equipment that most combat soldiers have for, for command and control is the telephone. And one of the reasons that you have chateau generalship in World War I, guys trying to direct the battle well behind the line, is that's where the telephones come to. That if you try to go forward as a general into the front line, you now aren't controlling and commanding anyone. But the problem with that landline is anything could break it. 
You do have that new technology in the lower right-hand corner, wireless telegraphy, but that weighs 2,000 pounds, and it's not going across no man's land anytime soon. And because you cannot quickly communicate with the soldiers at the front, not only is command and control a problem, but your use of the big stick, artillery, is a problem. This is another one of those battle maps uh, from Vimy Ridge in April of 1917. All those little lines there are where the artillery is going to fall. This is a creeping barrage. My artillery guys or my infantry guys, unlike today, can't pick up the phone and call and get fired. You have to pre-plan every artillery bombardment, and you make the best that you can out of this. I'm going to put all this line on the map. I'm going to drop the artillery right here, and then at a pre-timed, uh, pre-agreed upon time, it will then move on to the next line. And the hope is your infantry will stay right behind that creeping barrage right till they jump in the trench and take out the Germans. But you saw what that terrain looked like. And the problem here, since I don't have responsive communications, is the artillery guys are going to adhere to this plan. At this time, I'm doing this, then I'm going to stop, move 15 uh, meters on, and I'm going to do it again. And if the infantry is stopped, the barrage keeps going and is never coming back. But as the Allies are figuring this out, inventing this new science of artillery, they're learning how to use this thing as a hammer. And they can. The Germans are under a British blockade. They have a limited access to supplies. The British and the French can rely upon a huge world-spanning empire, and oh, by the way, the good people of the United States, to keep building them shells. And over the course of the Battle of Verdun in 1916, and over the course of the Battle of the Somme, even though it is a disaster on the first day for the British Army, by the time those battles close in November and December of 1916, the Allies have slowly and painfully learned how to use artillery as a hammer. I don't like this grid square. It offends me. Make it go away. And everything in it. You'll notice here that the casualty rates between the British and the French and the Germans at the Battle of the Somme, despite that disaster on the first day, by the time the battle grinds to an end, are almost equal. Part of that is the Germans have to learn, too. Their doctrine is flawed, and they've got to figure it out as they go along. The original German doctrine is if you lose a trench, you counterattack and take it back. Now, after you do that a few times, the Allies figure that out. Hey, you know, hey, we caught this trench. Let's see, the Germans are going to counterattack? No. And once you figure that out, you do things like, okay, we've captured the trench. How about you start laying artillery right in front of the trenches to destroy any counterattacks that come through? But now we've seen that switch. The German doctrine isn't working, so they change it too. So in late 1916, they changed their tactical doctrine. They actually give up parts of France to go to better terrain. When you're in somebody else's backyard, you can do that. And they create a defense in depth, an elastic defense in depth. You take and use terrain now. You don't go on the front side of the hill. You go on the back side of the hill. So the Allied artillery is not as effective. You don't rely on huge numbers of trenches that can be seen by the aircraft. You now go with concreted pillboxes with machine guns with interlocking fields of fire. So when the Allies attack, your observation posts pick them up, drop the artillery on, they get to the top of the hill, they're skylined, and you start bringing in as much fire as you can. The minute that the Allies go on the other side of the hill, the officers in those chateaus have no idea where they are. And now the Allies have to pick their way through these interlocking machine guns. And as they're doing that, they're getting attrited, their officers are getting lost, they're short on uh, supplies, and then and only then the Germans launch their counterattack. So right when the Allies believe they figured it out, the Germans change the game. World War I is also bringing in lots of high tech. I've got to find something to give the guys an advantage as they're trying to, uh, to break through the trenches uh, and restore mobility to the battlefield. And we have a couple of technologies that they're going to play with. Uh, technologies that with some development, we still see in the military today. 
One of the first ones is, you're going to start giving the infantrymen a lot more firepower. This is what a French infantry platoon, and at, at World War I, a platoon is really the lowest tactical unit that you have. That's what they looked like in 1914, with their bright red breeches and their bright blue jackets. The heaviest weapon that they have is the infantryman's rifle. This is the same platoon by 1917. Not only are the uniforms different, but you have a lot fewer men. You figured out if you're going to survive, you had better give the soldiers a lot more training because you're going to have to rely upon them and their leaders to use their own initiative. And to make it easier for those junior officers and sergeants to command them, you make them smaller. But as you make them smaller, you give them a lot more weapons. Interestingly, this infantry platoon looks a lot like my son's infantry platoon in Alaska. He's an infantry private. So this would look familiar to him. We've got some other high tech. Uh, in 1915, the Germans come up with the idea of using poison gas as a way of breaking through no man's land, crossing no man's land and breaking through. Uh, in fact, Fritz Halber, who will later get a Nobel Prize for his work in nitrogen, uh, will be the one who comes up with this. And it's a pretty brutally simple idea. If you are coughing your guts out, if you are dying or you are running away, you're not shooting at my infantry as they're attacking. And when the Germans first used this on the 22nd of April, 1915, it works. They actually knock a hole in the Allied lines seven miles across, three and a half miles deep. So as we know, the Germans then goose up to Paris and end the war. Well, there's some problems. Poison gas works. But when you're talking about using gas, you are now reliant upon the weather. And the Germans have to postpone this attack time and time again to get just the right weather conditions. The problem with Germany is it's already short of manpower. So they can't afford to have a lot of guys sitting behind the line waiting for an attack that might not come. So by the time the weather conditions are right and they use poison gas, the reserves that the German army had earmarked for that offensive have already been moved somewhere else. There's also a human problem here. Think about how you would try to explain this to the German soldier. Hey, Hans, we got a cool new weapon. We call it human raid. We're going to release it from big capsules, and it's going to float across no man's land with a big green cloud of chlorine. All you got to do is follow the bouncing green cloud. Now, if you're the German soldier and you're told this, you know what you say? Nine, what are you, crazy? OK, they're all from Missouri. Show me. Show me that this stuff works. And so they sort of, I'm coming, dragging their feet. And by the time they've actually realized how big of a success they've had, the Allies have counterattacked and closed off the sailing. Now the problem with gas is the cat's out of the bag. And within days, not within weeks, not within months, within days of the first use of poison gas, you get the first gas mask. Pretty freaking basic, right? <laughs> All that is is a cotton wadding pad that has a, uh, basically a bicarbonate soda solution. You keep it wet, you wear it over your nose and your mouth. And uh, just for cool, you have some little steampunk goggles to do your glasses. You come up with this and get them in the trenches within the first five days. Now, what really shocks me, and I've studied war for a while now, uh, it's made me a deep, dark cynic, you know? If you study military history, it'll make you a cynical person. Uh, it, it, and you look at the amount of thought that's going into the weapons technology, it'll depress you. You know, find a cure for cancer, screw that. Find a way to kill off half the population of Europe, sign us up. So the minute that chlorine gas doesn't work, they don't say, oh, well, that was a good idea. They go, why don't we come up with a better gas? And so within a couple of months, they come up with phosgene. And phosgene is, is actually the biggest killer gas of World War I. It's largely uh, colorless and largely odorless. Just a real faint smell. And it kills because the soldiers don't have an immediate response to it like chlorine. So you're in it, you're sucking it in, and you're actually getting a lethal dose without knowing it. And so you die a couple of days later. Now, that's horrible. But the generals go, yeah, that's nice, but what have you done for me lately? I want the guys to crack right now. I need immediate results. And of course, as soon as you come out with chlorine, or correction, phosgene, 
you come out with a new gas mask. And finally, in 1917, of course, you come out with the worst gas in the all, mustard gas. Now, mustard gas is what we call a blister agent. So when it gets on your skin, it raises these huge, nasty, pus-filled blisters. Okay? Uh, it tends to affect the moist areas of the body most virulently. Your eyes, your nose, your mouth, your armpits, gentlemen. Other places. And when you get mustard in all those other places, you don't feel like playing soldier anymore, right? Now, that's bad enough, but of course, if you breathe that mustard gas in, now those nasty, big, pus-filled blisters are on your lungs. And what happens is, over time, they continue to grow, they pop, they fill your lungs full of fluid, and you drown. But the minute that you come out with that, the Allies, of course, come out with a new gas mask. This is the British small box respirator. The Americans will basically bake their uh, mask based upon this. And it'll protect you against mustard. Unlike a modern gas mask, it's not airtight. Okay? So there's going to be some of that mustard gas that gets in. To make it work, just to give you an idea how nasty this is, you have to use this clip to keep your nose closed, and you have to breathe in and out of this tube. Okay? Now, anybody been a snorkeler here? Okay. I hate snorkeling. After a couple minutes, my jaw starts to hurt. Mustard is persistent, so you will have this snorkel between your teeth for three to four hours. Okay? It will severely restrict your vision, but at least keep you from dying. And until the uh, end of the war, basically now that you've had a defense against the gas, it becomes more of a harassment, a way of, of neutralizing some of the advantages uh, of one side or the other, but not something that's gonna kill a lot of guys. <laughs> That'll change when the Americans come in. Uh, we'll suffer a number of casualties from gas, mostly because we are horribly trained. Uh, and tra troops that know how to use the gas mask actually don't do too bad. So we've tried poison gas. That hasn't fixed the problem. In September of 1916, we come up with something really cool. Now, I was a tanker. I like to ride around on tanks. And this is you know, my great-great-granddaddy. A tank is a pretty simple idea. Mobile protected firepower. I'm going to take something that can cross through all of that shell-torn ground. It's going to be able to crush that nasty German barbed wire. It's Got armor protection so the machine guns can't get in and some of the shells can't get in, and it's going to have machine guns and cannons to destroy the German strong points, destroy the German machine guns. Now, here's the problem you know how you get a tank in 1916? Yeah, neither did they. But they look around the world and come up with some ideas. In the United States, there's something called a Holt agricultural tractor being used in farms around Lawrence, for example pulling plows and other things. It's on a caterpillar tractor. There's things that you need to go across nasty mud. So the Brits take this American idea, Holt Agricultural dra uh, Tractor, and they bolt on hillbilly armor. Now, a Holt Agricultural Tractor is designed to do a lot of things. Putting a lot of big cannons and machine guns and armor plate on the outside is probably not one of them. And you see this. The first day the tank is used uh, on, in September of 1916, you start the attack with 49 tanks, and that's almost the entire number of tanks in the world at that time. And a lot of them, 17 of them, don't even make it to the front. They break down before they get there. So you only begin the attack with 32 tanks, and you see what happens from there. Good idea, and it shows enough potential to get Douglas A., this is one of his more lucid moments, to go, hey, these tanks are pretty cool, worth investing in. Good idea, but the technology is still not there yet. So by the time you get to August of 1918, you get the Battle of Amiens, the black day of the German army, where the British army basically cracks through the German lines, you still have this problem. You start with 453 tanks, but you see what happens. By the end of the first day of battle, you're down to 155 tanks. The day after that, 85 tanks. Anybody tell me what you think is going to happen by the 12th of August? You're not going to have any tanks. Okay? That, and that, that's bad. This is a good idea, and you are developing these concepts of combined warfare. In fact, the Battle of Amiens, the British are combining air power, aircraft strafing the Germans, and also aircraft going deep to interdict their flow of supplies and reinforcements, combined with artillery, combined with tanks, combined with infantry together. They are seeing the way. In fact, the combined arms that we use today in the U.S. Army 
is not a whole heck of a lot different than what they were doing here. But the technology has still not developed enough to make it reliable. Now, if you're the Germans, you've got a problem. You've been fighting a two-front war. And 1917 is going to be a break year for them. On the plus side, the Russians go off in revolution. And by early 1918, they will remove themselves from the war, thus freeing you from a two-front war. Problem is, the Germans do some goofy things that require them to leave a million men to get their ill-gotten gains in the Ukraine. On the downside, in April of 1917, the United States enters the war. Germany is on the ropes. Their economy is on the ropes. People at home are beginning to feel the effects of starvation because of the British blockade. While the Allies are fielding tanks and more and more artillery pieces and shells, the Germans can't match it. They can't match you tank for tank. In fact, most of the tanks that the German army uses are actually captured from the British and the French. They surely can't make enough artillery and they can't make enough shells to match it. They can't fight the war that the Allies are fighting. And they know if they don't find a solution to this war quickly, in early 1918, they're going to lose it. The Americans are coming, and the Americans are coming big. The red line is the German rifle strength on the Western Front in April of 1918. The blue line is the Allied rifle strength. And they're going to roll the dice in 1918 to see if they can win the war. But you'll notice that their manpower advantage is still not that great. Now, the Germans have also gone through those same changes at the lower levels that you saw with that French platoon. This is what a German infantry battalion looks like in 1914. They don't even have their own machine guns. That's kept up at the regiment. This is that same battalion by 1917. So now I am giving the battalion commander and the company commanders a lot more weapons because I'm expecting them to do a lot more stuff on their own. But the Germans are going to take this one step further because they have to. If I can't match the Allies in technology, and I can't match the Allies in output of shells, the only solution the Germans have is to try to do things better. So by 1918, they fielded both new artillery tactics to get the most effectiveness out of their shells, but they also developed a new infantry tactic. We'll call them stormtroop tactics. Not those guys in Star Wars in the white uh, uniforms that can't hit anything. These guys are actually pretty specialized troops. You're going to take these infantrymen and not do mass attacks like you see at the Somme and Verdun. What you're going to do is give these guys a lot of specialty training. You're going to give them a lot of heavy weapons. And you're going to send them out. What I want you to do is go around the strong points of the enemy, infiltrate through the Allied lines, take out the machine guns from the rear, but then I want you to keep driving deep. I want you, these little groups of soldiers, highly trained specialist soldiers, to then go deep against the enemy command post. And I want you to go deep against the enemy's artillery. Because if you can take out the enemy's artillery and you can take out their command post, you're going to break the ability of the Allies to do that technical magic that they've been doing with their artillery. And you're even going to reorganize them. Again, you saw what the infantry battalion looked like in 1917. This is what that stormtrooper battalion looks like. You are specializing the units, and you are giving them an unprecedented amount of light weapons so they can accomplish the mission you're giving them, exercise their own mission. But here the Germans are stuck. If you're going to get these specially trained soldiers who can exercise initiative and have the smarts to take advantage of opportunities that rise and fall on the battlefield, then here's a special type of soldier you're looking for. They need to be young. They need to be in very good shape. And they need to be smarter than the average bear. The problem is, by 1918, those guys are uh, dead. So the Germans pull out some tricks. To get these type of soldiers in these specialized units, 
What they basically do is go to all the other regular infantry divisions and say, oh, okay, here's our good guys. I'm taking all of these and I'm leaving you with me. <laughs> Old beat up guys, okay? And they're gonna use these stormtroopers uh, in the Ludendorff Offensive, 21 March, 1918. And again, they're going to tactically do some wonderful stuff. They attack the British on the Somme front, and they push the British back to where they started the Battle of the Somme in July of 1916. But the problem is, when you have these elite troops, and it's the same problem we have today, that elite specialist troops are exceptionally fragile. And these stormtroopers, doing wonderful things, are taking inordinately high casualties. So these German pushes are running out of steam because the guys are just moving basically on their feet like infantry. There's no mechanization like you see with the Allied armies. And when the attack doesn't work here on the Somme, they'll shift it to another location and they'll have some breakthroughs, but then it runs out of steam. And every time they do this, those elite troops are being attrited one after the other. So finally, by the summer of 1918, who are you left with? Me, okay? And I'm thinking about going home, I'm just saying. In the process, though, we've seen all this back and forth, the change of technology, the change of techniques and doctrine. In the process of this ugly, bloody experimentation, the Allies essentially create modern conventional war as we know it today. And I love this analogy. Uh, there's once an argument that said, if you were to take a British infantry battalion commander from the Battle of Waterloo, 1815, put him in a time machine and move him to, uh, move him to June of 1914, before World War I begins, give him a quick class on buttonology, he understands the battlefield, that infantry still basically worked the way that infantry did in his time, that artillery still worked in the way artillery worked, cavalry still worked the way that cavalry worked. 99 years in the past. But if you were to take an infantry battalion commander from 1914, put him in a time machine, and move him three years to the future, he's lost. The pieces parts no longer work the way they did just four years before. But if you were to take that infantry battalion commander from Amiens in 1918, move him to the Persian Gulf War of 1991, he understands the battlefield. <coughs> The planes are moving faster, the tanks are cooler, the, the tankers are cooler too, just saying. <laughs> but the pieces parts work the way the pieces parts did in his time. Okay, thank you for your attention. We've covered a lot of area. We've killed off the flower of European manhood. What are your questions? Thank you. To wait for the mic. <laughs> Thank you. I have two kind of narrow questions. Sure. When, when you talked about how the Germans reorganized their uh, command structure and whatever towards the end of the war, I noticed the musicians dropped out. Was that true? Uh, the munition, musicians, even in 1914, uh, in battle, are your stretcher bearers. Oh, they're du uh, dual service. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And by 1917, they're a, they're a luxury. You know, the only place at the Kaiser's headquarters. So, yeah, they were already I just gone. caught my attention. And then another narrow question, I guess. When you said uh, the Second Battle of the Somme, they pushed them back to where they were three, three years earlier. Yes. How far was that in meters or yards? Or? Uh, I believe it's somewhere on the line of 30 miles. 30 miles? Yes. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a monumental breakthrough. Okay. Uh, and it forces the Allies uh, to make their own changes. Uh, and the most important, frankly, uh, has nothing to do with technology or all this. It's, it's about command and control that prior to the shock of the German breakthrough, the French did their thing, the British did their thing, the Belgians did their thing, and the Americans did their thing. And so Ferdinand Foch that I keep uh, addressing here in the, uh, in the uh, lecture, uh, finally everybody agrees we need a, a supreme allied commander to orchestrate everything, and Foch is the man. Uh, since France is still contributing the majority of the troops and suffering the greatest casualties, it's a Frenchman who's going to leave. A good question. Thank you. Yes, sir. 
Uh, what uh, aircraft did the United States contribute? Did, did the United States uh, have any advanced aircraft for this, or? Uh, no. <laughs> the, uh, the United States uh, is a basket case uh, going into World War I. Uh, we wait 17th uh, in the world behind Romania and Portugal and the size of our army when the war breaks out in 1914. Uh, when we enter the war in April, I believe we have something around 50-odd uh, pilots. Uh, and roughly 40 operational aircraft. Most of them are Curtis Jennies, which will spend the war uh, as training planes. Uh, the Americans will make a big deal about creating the Liberty engine, uh, and we'll put it in the British uh, DH-4 fuselage, uh, and the, the pilots will call it flaming coffins. So we are not quite the, the uh, aeronautic uh, masters that we are today. So, so what airplane did the Hedy Richard the SPAD. Uh, in fact, because we are so woefully prepared, uh, unprepared for the war, uh, the majority of our artillery, all of our tanks, uh, the majority of our machine guns and aircraft come from the Allies. Uh, so Rickenbacker, uh, I believe, starts with a Newport and goes to a SPAD. That's where he wins his Medal of Honor, uh, as do most of our fighter pilots. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, can you give us any, I don't know, it's like a really, uh, like a lot of the players have come about like Patton and, and then his, his counterpart Rommel and like even Hitler. Could you explain like kind of what they're doing at this sure. time? And well, the, the, again, this is a hard lesson and it leaves an indelible uh, mark on everyone who participates in it. Uh, George Patton will command the first tank brigade of the American Expeditionary Force. Uh, he will see action at Samiel uh, in September. Uh, early September 1918. I will then command the brigade uh, going into the Battle of Musargon on the 26th of uh, September and will be severely wounded in the first day of fighting. Uh, and then we'll spend the rest of the war recuperating. Uh, but he will play around with tanks. Uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower uh, will spend the war uh, at Camp Colt, uh, Pennsylvania as, a, as the guy training tank crewmen here in the States. Uh, Erwin Rommel uh, will basically be one of those stormtroop guys. Uh, he will win his Pour le Marit, the, uh, the highest German decoration uh, fighting against the Italians at Caporetto in uh, November of 1917, basically doing that infiltration tactics. Uh, and he learns the same thing, that once you get the enemy on the run, you keep the scare up. Uh, and so uh, he's, he is a captain commanding a battalion which will grow to nearly a regiment. Uh, and so a, a lot of the, the, the people who will go on to, uh, to see greatness later on, uh, we'll take away from this. On the other side, you get Bernard Law Montgomery, who of course will, will be the British uh, highest ranking commander in World War II, will fight through the Somme. He'll be wounded, he'll fight through, so he sees the ugliness of the trenches, uh, and that convinces, Monty? yes, Monty, yeah, the full Monty, yeah. That, that, uh, that teaches him to be very, very cautious. And before you attack, you do that set piece battle where all the artillery is in place, everything else is in place to minimize the casualties. Okay. Yeah, so different lessons. Not good question. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned at one point that um, after the landscape was changed by all the shelling, the need for, for the engineers. Did engineering, and looking at, I think there's a bridge under that tank in this picture, did engineering grow up or? come of age in not, the first war war or not was as it much, not as much this is uh this is old style combat engineering in other words here's your shovel here's your pick go fill in the holes and so um most of the the most important engineer work for the allies is actually done building the little railroads and the connectors and the roads behind the lines just to keep the supplies going uh, in fact uh, during the Battle of Verdun in 1916, there's something called the Bois Sacré, the Sacred Way. It's the one road where all the, the French reinforcements and artillery supplies comes through. Uh, and to keep that road going, uh, the French detail, I believe something like, uh, I don't want to, I'll make this up, <laughs> a huge number, several tens of thousands of men just to keep it going every day. Uh, and so that type of engineer work is important. When it comes to crossing no man's land like that, they, the technology hasn't developed to the point 
where it's helping them out. But good question. That, that'll come in World War II a little bit more. Yes, ma'am. Oops, I'm sorry. I'll go here first. I was just wondering, did uh, all of the combatants use cons conscription in World War I? Uh, all the major combatants did, absolutely. Um, the British start without it, uh, and they quickly find out that uh, by 19, late 1915, they're not getting enough volunteers, especially when you get the huge number of casualties. Uh, now, this is one of the places where the Americans learn. Uh, so when we go into the war in April of 1917, uh, within two weeks of us entering, Wilson's already decided that we're going to do conscription. We're going to break with American tradition and raise uh, the vast majority of our troops, nearly 75 percent, uh, from draftees. Uh, and when you think about having to feed this maw, they all come to this. Uh, and that's the other problem when you, you plan on a short war. Uh, when you plan on a short war, you conscript everybody. Uh, but then when you figure out it's a long war, all of the major combatants have to come to the same conclusion. Uh, so in the winter of 1915, you see a scramble where you are releasing skilled workers that were in the ranks so they can go back to the factories to make the shells and the other stuff. And it's a delicate balance. This is mass total war. Uh, and in a mass total war, it requires the mobilization of every element of your society. You've got to balance uh, agriculture with industrial production, with administration, things like doctors at the home front, with the guys at the front. And, and everybody scrambles to figure this out. I would think it would be a morale problem, too. How so? Well, if they're drafted, you know, they're, they're not volunteering, and then they're oh, yeah. go over the top and, well, and all this sort of thing. If, if you look at, uh, especially France and, and uh, Germany prior to World War I, a military service had become part of sort of a civil expectation that you, you are really not going to be a full citizen, you're really not considered a full man until you've done your time in the service. Uh, the, the Brits will do the same thing, that this becomes uh, your patriotic duty. And the vast majority of the soldiers generally accept that. That's one of the reasons uh, they keep going. Uh, and in the armies that crack, like the Russian army, uh, and the Italian army in 1917 comes close to it, uh, it's when you have failed to bring the guys in, but at the same time take care of their needs, the expectations of the society, that things start to rot. So it's amazing probably that more nations don't break. Did they have to have the episode of the firing squad? Uh, yes. Uh, in fact, in, in April 1917, uh, 100 years ago, uh, the French, 50% of the divisions of the French army undergo what the French call collective indiscipline, what we'd call mutiny. Uh, and it comes after, we, we talked, I, I showed you that change in German doctrine. At the end of Verdun, the French army believes that they've got the, the answer, that they've figured out how to use artillery. Uh, then the Germans change the rules of the game. And so in 1917, Robert Nivelle, the French commander, is basically promising the politicians and the soldiers that his offensive against Chemin de Dame is going to break through the lines and end the war. Uh, and when the French try their same old tricks against the new doctrine, the French soldiers lose massive amounts of men and, and basically lose heart. But even after they lose heart and go into collective indiscipline, the agreement of the soldier is, we're not going to attack, but we're also not going to let the Germans take any more of France. So it's that delicate ballet. But you're right, morale is always going to be an issue. Good question. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned the role of the engineers, but I wanted to point out that they had a lot of them employing miners that were digging miles and miles of, of tunnels yes. way under the trenches and laying explosive charges to collapse the enemy trenches and, and, and engage them with flamethrowers and stuff like that through the trenches, the, underneath the trenches. No, oh, absolutely. Uh, in fact, uh, there's a place called the Butte de Valcois in uh, France, uh, just to the northwest uh, of, of Verdun, which is on a commanding hill. Uh, and whoever commanded the hill could then use the artillery. Uh, and between 1915 and the time the Americans capture it in, in 1918, there's this constant war. And, and the hill is, uh, you know, not much larger than the Dole Center here. But the French will come in from one side, dig out a gallery underneath the German trenches, pack it full of explosives, and blow it up, 
and the Germans would do the same. And so by the time the war was over, it was a nice little town. You can go there today, it's nothing but crater upon crater. Uh, and at the first day of the Battle of the Somme, the British do the same thing, lay mines underneath the German lines. Uh, they blow up, but then it's a race. Can the other guy you know, recapture the lip of the, the crater before you can attack? Oh, oh, by the way, there was still one of those mines that didn't go off on the battle that's still there, and they don't know where it is. So <laughs> a, a lightning strike shot off another one, I believe, in the 60s. So be careful if you're around the Somme. But, Absolutely, and the same idea that if, if the front line trenches are, are gone, then it makes your crossing no man's land and, and capturing that first trench that much easier. But thank you, good, good observation. Yes, sir. Hi, thanks for a great lecture. Um, I have a question about the uh, effect on civilian societies in America from World War I. Sure. For example, in Europe, you started to see women working outside of the home in large numbers in munitions factories, and that's something that will have continued, is there, America was further away from the theater of war, uh, was there something like that happened in American civilian society? Oh, absolutely. Uh, well, like what? Uh, well, you see, and you see this in, in all the European societies, but probably more in the French, the British, and the American than you do necessarily in the central powers for some cultural reasons. Uh, uh, in fact, when you're building all of those shells, uh, a lot of the, the people who are building them in England are, are women. Uh, and the problem is it's, it's a chemical explosive uh, and it's toxic. Uh, it turns your skin yellow uh, and if you breathe it in, it poisons you. In fact, they call them canaries because it actually changes their skin to yellow. Uh, and both in Britain and the United States, women serving uh, in unprecedented numbers in industry uh, will ultimately lead to the right to vote. Uh, in fact, Woodrow Wilson will come out as a, a strong support, uh, proponent uh, for giving women the right to vote because of uh, the, the work that they do. Uh, and they'll get it in 1920, uh, about a month, a year and a half after the war. So it's changing society as it's changing um, the, the battlefront itself. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Can you give me a definition of combined arms? Ah, <laughs> silly me. Uh, combined worms is you're basically trying to get the best out of every one of the components that you have. Uh, so uh, by the time of the Battle of Amiens, you had the air service, the aircraft, you had artillery, you had the infantry, you had the artillery, you had the engineers. And what you're trying to do is to maximize the effectiveness of each of those while overcoming their weaknesses. Uh, so for example, the tanks would go through, break down the wire, suppress the, the, uh, uh, the emplacements, machine guns, the infantry would be right behind them. So the minute that the tanks break through, they're now consolidating the trench. The artillery, of course, has paved the way for all that are going on. So what you're trying to do is, is create a massive, nasty stew for the enemy that puts them in a dilemma. And, and we still do the same thing today, that we'll combine air power and artillery and tanks and infantry uh, and special ops all together to create that dilemma for the enemy. Did, did, did that clarify? Yeah, I mean, is that why we didn't have trench warfare in World War II? Oh, well, uh, we do have trench warfare in some places in World War II. If you look at Stalingrad and, and some of the other battles, it's, it's, the trench has become, uh, in many ways, the, the city itself. Uh, we, we are, we're horrified by World War I because it's, it is attritional war. <laughs> World War II is mobile attritional war. You're going to lose a lot more people, but, but it's something psychological. When you're only taking you know, a, a couple of yards for losing several thousand men, it's, it's futile. When you were taking several tens uh, or twenties of miles a day and losing the same amount of guys, somehow at least you feel like you're accomplishing something. So both of them are mass of total attritional wars, uh, but the ability of now aviation and the perfection of things like tanks and mechanized infantry uh, is allowing you to go through those defenses and keep the enemy off balance uh, so they can't dig in and get those advantages from the defense. Uh, good question. Thank you. I have a really good question. Let's hear it. I was just joking. I was just joking. <laughs> um, has trench warfare been used before World War One is it the first time, or is oh, it? Oh no, is uh, it trench warfare is as, as old as warfare. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that was a really bad question. Yeah. No, 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 not at all. No, that's a good one. Uh, 
it, but it's, when was French warfare first used in warfare? Oh, no, no. Stump, stump you and stumping you. Uh, if you go to a, a place in, in Britain called Maiden Fort, it's an Iron Age fort where they basically created on top of a hill concentric defenses out of earthworks. So it's, it's almost as old as warfare because if, if you're up on a hill and you're dug in and the other guy's got to come up the hill, you've got an advantage. Uh, if you look at, at modern trench warfare, uh, siege warfare is basically trench warfare, and that's been long, around forever. In the American Civil War, uh, especially in 1864 and 1865, you start to see the glimmers uh, of what you'll see in, in World War I. Uh, in the Atlanta campaign, uh, Sherman versus Johnson and then Hood uh, in the summer of 1864, massive amounts of field fortifications on the Kennesaw Line and also around Atlanta, uh, and outside of Petersburg, Virginia, the same thing. And, and you're starting to see the same dynamic uh, and it's just as deadly if you're attacking uh, relatively in the Civil War. Your hope of breaking into those trenches is, is pretty, pretty dim, but it's lacking the, the, the explosive power of artillery and the amount of firepower that you'll see in World War I. So it was just lacking that extra little bit of nastiness. Good question. That's a big question. Uh, Dr. Sean, subsequent to the, subsequent to the war, uh, with these staggering casualties on, on all sides, what did that do to government policies uh, to do something about trying to reestablish a population? Uh, were, were there active government programs for that? I mean, we've lost millions and millions of people here. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, and, and this is going to be felt especially by the French. Uh, the French will lose 1.3 million men in the war. Uh, and percentage-wise, they're only lagging behind the Serbians as the percentage of the population that's lost. Uh, and France already had a declining population, especially relative to Germany, before the war even started. Uh, and so when you not only lose that number of men, but also when you, when you have an army of, uh, of pushing 6 million during the war, those guys aren't, you know, making sweet, sweet love. So uh, by the time you get to the 1930s, you have what the French call the hollow years. Uh, in fact, one French politician will say that the, uh, the biggest threat to French uh, security coming in that area is fornication. So we need more of it. Uh, and the, the population of France actually does not return to its pre-1914 rate until the 1960s uh, because of that bubble. Uh, it gets so bad that uh, when the war ends, uh, the French are actually actively trying to convince the American soldiers to stay, okay? Stay, meet Fifi, settle down, have a good life. And, and some of the soldiers do it. Um, uh, and some of the totalitarian regimes that will rise, uh, be it Mussolini's Italy, be it the Japanese, be it uh, Hitler's Germany, and be it Stalin's Russia, uh, will all push uh, for, you know, be, go forth and be multiple, you know, be fruitful, because they see that as a, uh, as a critical wartime uh, necessity. Uh, the democracies, not so much. Uh, what they will do for the French, for example, will have a big influence on World War II. Uh, Going into World War I, the French soldier was conscripted for three years. Uh, so they could match the, the relative number of the Germans. After the war, we need those French guys to be, you know, meet and feed. Uh, and so in 1930, they lower the amount of time the soldiers spend in the ranks from three years to one year. And when you take out time for leaves and you take out time for holidays, you let them go back home and bring in the, uh, the crops, for example, of that one year that you have that French soldier in the critical period of 1930, 165 days you have that soldier for training. Uh, and any military guys here, former military guys? Yeah, we got a few. You, you can't do much with a soldier in 165 days. You, you can barely teach them to march and maybe a little bit of shooting. Uh, and so by the time you get to 1940, the German soldiers are generally just better trained than the French conscripts that are coming up. And that all goes back to that population policy. Good question. Good question. Well, now that I've bored the rest of you, good. Um, 
How much training did the, uh, you know, we lost a lot of casualties there in that last month of the war. Yes. How much training did the, uh, let's say, the National Guard divisions? There's a great book on that. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> And like uh, that. You know, this is uh, the United States, it's really, a, it, it's almost a national tragedy what happens. And it's a shame that what we do. Um, we go into this war, and, and we're still that army of 1914, the guys with the red britches, if you were compared to the French, that's thrown into 1917, 1918. And while the Allies and the Germans have all learned, we, we really haven't caught up. And so we are trying to learn everything that they've painfully done in three years in a very short amount of time. Uh, and uh, both due to a lack of time uh, and lack of resources, we don't have enough machine guns to train with, we don't have enough artillery pieces to train with. Most of the artillerymen never see the cannons that they're going to use until they pick it up for the French, same thing with the machine guns. Uh, is, uh, for the most part, the American soldiers are going into battle horribly ill-trained and horribly ill-prepared. Uh, in October of 1918, the Battle of, of, of Meuse Argonne is the bloodiest month in American history. Uh, in the second week of the battle, we lose over 6,000 dead. And again, compare that to 17 years of, of fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and once we start losing all those guys, we're really not prepared for bringing in the, the replacements. And one of the greatest, saddest things I've ever read about in American history uh, is that you have a number of soldiers that are showing up on the front lines in the fall of 1918 that were drafted, spent a couple of days in camp, were put on ships, sent to France, and were in the front lines a month later. And there are tales of soldiers having to teach these replacements how to load their rifles as they were going into battle. That's a crime. And, and thank God we're a little bit better than that now. And it's amazing that they continue to fight and didn't crack in the, in the face of that. Didn't we do a little of that in the early days of 1950 in Korea? Uh, I would go to Tom Hansen for that answer, but uh, we, we have some similar problems. Uh, you, you, you've got that rapid transition from peacetime to wartime. Uh, in fact, Dr. Hansen has written a book on this that I highly recommend, uh, though it's probably not as bad as uh, what some of the accounts have, have made it out to be. But we always have that problem. We, we uh, uh, the, the national security state that we have today uh, is really only a product of that mid-1950s to the present. If you look at American wars prior to that, we are never really prepared for what we're facing. Uh, and, and in the case of World War I and World War II, uh, as we're learning these lessons, we're going up against guys that have been doing it for a while. And, and they beat on us quite a bit before we figure it out. Yes, sir. At uh, Vimy Ridge, there was um, a change, a slight change in offensive coordination. Yes. And uh, it seems to me that uh, and it met with a modicum of success. Yep. But it seems to me after that, that knowledge wasn't really passed on. Well, am I right? Or uh, wrong? This is, this is um, the dilemma that they deal with in World War I. Uh, and the French call it uh, grignotage or pierce. Do you go for a small nibbling offensive where you just limit your objective, you grab the piece of terrain and you hold it, or do you go for the pierce, the, the breakthrough? Uh, and Vimy Ridge uh, and what will happen around Hill 60, which is, uh, is just in that same neighborhood, is that type of precisely prepared set-piece battle. So you, you have the time, you bring up the forces, you study the enemy, you dig those uh, tunnels underneath the enemy line to blow them up before you assault. Uh, but the idea is you're only going to go, grab what you have, and hold. And, and as long as you can do that, then the problem of what do you do with your artillery now that, that you've captured it doesn't become an issue. Where the offensives really start to break down in World War I it is after you've had that success, first of all, realizing you've had a success, and then being able to do something behind it. And if you have broken through, if you're gonna keep the success, you have gotta be able to bring up those supplies and those artillery. But if you're only doing that set piece battle like the Canadians pull off with Vimy, it's a lot easier. Uh, but of course the downside to that is the Allied Army would reach Berlin now. 
if they just kept those limited attacks, limited attacks. A good question. Uh, Sean, you described the, uh, the uh, efforts of the uh, British and French uh, and the efforts of the Germans over, over uh, four long years uh, to try to uh, come up with some uh, solution and uh, break through. The uh, British and French have their tanks and planes, the Germans have their, their gas, their uh, multiple trench lines, their stormtroopers. Uh, the question is, uh, if you look at the Allies and Germans uh, respectively, uh, in your opinion, who did the better job of doctrinal development and also uh, who came, uh, which side came closest developing the methods that would be uh, successful in World War II? Uh, we love the Germans. And we're guilty of this at Fort Leavenworth. Oh, the Germans, in fact, there's an old saying, you've never really experienced war and that you fought the Germans. <laughs> Which is probably said by the Germans, I don't know. But, uh, but the Germans are, sort of have a propensity for war. Uh, a lot of that has to do with geography. Uh, but I think we overstate that. Uh, the Germans are, are really good at some of the tactical stuff, but when it comes to making strategy, they're a basket case. And the disasters that you will see in World War II are presaged by the disasters, the disastrous strategic decisions that they make in World War I. And I think we also overemphasize uh, the German tactical acumen. What they do have is a official army system for capturing honestly and opening, open, uh, openly the mistakes that are made in trying to, to systematically uh, put systems in place. But at the same time, the Allies know the advantages that they have and are playing them as best they can. And a lot of the stormtrooper tactics that you see are also being done by the British and the French uh, on a much smaller scale. So they're all making these innovations. Um, the Germans just tend to get some of the, the better credit for it. What the Germans will do, though, in the 1920s and 1930s uh, is ask ugly questions. Uh, while the, the British and the French go, hey, we won, <laughs> that stunk, let's not do it again, uh, German geography and the, the, the fact that they live in an ugly crack house neighborhood convinces them that they had better continue to study this. Uh, and so uh, under a general named Hans von Sect, uh, they do probably the most open and honest investigation of the war. And the first thing he says is, tell me what happened, honestly, openly. Let reputations be crushed if it need be, because this is too important. So tell me what happened, tell me why it happened, which is also important. And once you tell me what happened, honestly, tell me why it happened, honestly, then and only then you can get to the important thing is, okay, now what are we gonna do about it? Uh, and the British, uh, are a little bit more hesitant of damaging reputation. So their history of World War I tends to be a little more skewed. Uh, the French uh, are about the same, but the French have the Germans close by, so they have to take war seriously. Uh, the French are often uh, criticized for being too defensive. Uh, the number one takeaway they, their army has from World War I is firepower kills, firepower kills, firepower kills. And the Maginot line and the defensive doctrine going into World War II is designed to do just that. Uh, and they're often maligned for it. Uh, the problem is the French are absolutely right. Uh, the, the number one killer in World War I is artillery. The number one killer in World War II is artillery. Uh, the problem is the Germans get moving much quicker than the French can respond. And, and by the time the French are trying to learn these lessons, it's too late. Uh, the mechanization has, has given the Germans the advantage. But we can talk about that after. Anyone else? Good. Well, thank you very much for your attention. I'll be around to ask any other questions that you have.